Okay. Um, yeah, today we have a special guest with us. I am happy to introduce Comrade Nilot Palbazu by CPIM. Uh, thanks for joining us. We'll be talking about imperialism and war from the perspective of our comrades in India. Therefore, Comrade Basu will give us a talk about 20 minutes. And after that, Satya will ask some questions to sharpen the discussion. And then you can ask him your questions as well. Due to the high number of participants, we muted your microphones, but you're welcome to raise your hand so we can pick you to ask your question. We can also translate them from German to English for you. The discussion of our, the audio of our discussion today will be recorded and available on YouTube later. Before we finally start, I will give you a short introduction on CPIM and Comrade Basel. The Communist Party of India Marxist CPIM was formed in the year 1964. The CPIM sees itself as the successor of the anti-imperialist struggle and the carrier of revolutionary legacy of the undivided Communist Party, which was founded in 1920 in India. It was born in the struggle against revisionism and sectarianism in the communist movement at the international and national level in order to defend the scientific and revolutionary tenets of Marxism-Leninism and its appropriate application in the concrete Indian conditions. Over the years, the party has emerged as the foremost left force in the country. The membership of the party, which was 118,683 at the time of its formation, has grown to 985,757 in 2021. In the last few elections, the CPIM has been contesting on an average of 13% on the total seats in India. In the 2019 general elections to the lower house of the parliament, the CPIM won three seats out of a total of four, uh, 543 seats. <clears throat> in the upper house of the parliament, the party has five seats. Currently, the CPIM heading of one state government in India, namely in the state of Kerala. Moreover, the CPIM was representing in the following state legislative assemblies in the states of Kerala, Tripura, Bihar, Rajasthan, Himachal Pradesh, Odisha, Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra, and Assam. And now some words about Nilot Palbazu. Comrade Nilot Palbazu is a lifelong communist and has been at the forefront of the Indian student and the communist struggle. Comrade Basu served as the general secretary of the Students' Federation of India from 1986 to 1993. He's a former member of the parliament and the current Politburo member of the CPIM. We are very thankful to have him to have Comrade Basu with us today, and are looking forward to our discussion. I will now hand over to him for his talk. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I must also thank you for having uh, invited uh, me uh, to represent the views of the Indian left in general and that of the uh, CPIM in particular. Uh, on the contemporary issues uh, of uh, how we are uh, taking on imperialism in our own way. Uh, as the introduction was being made, uh, in fact, uh, what was not made out was that uh, we have suffered uh, a few setbacks in the recent times uh, in the elections. Uh, the main reason for this is uh, a phenomenal growth in the ultra right forces, uh, as much as it is happening in uh, elsewhere in the world, it is also happening in India, and uh, it is uh, uh, on a, on a uh, twin track that uh, the ultra right uh, uh, has registered a rise in India. 
Uh, one is on the count of uh, the uh, major shifts in the economic uh, uh, policy making. And uh, the other uh, aspect is, of course, uh, the, the uh, offensive of what we say the Hindutva forces, the communal forces. And uh, being based in Germany, you must be uh, familiar with the use of uh, majoritarian ideology uh, for, for the uh, consolidation of uh, hegemony over uh, power. And that is precisely what has happened. Uh, and this actually, uh, the, the emergence of such a tendency uh, dates back to our uh, pre-independence days. Uh, as Max was uh, introducing us uh, as, as uh, bearers of the uh, anti-imperialist, anti-colonial uh, legacy in our freedom struggle, uh, this uh, uh, Hindu majoritarian force uh, was also uh, brought up largely at the behest of the uh, British uh, imperial powers, um, uh, trying to establish a religious identity as uh, the basis of our nationhood, which was opposed to uh, much of the uh, mainstream uh, thinking in our anti-imperialist struggle. And uh, therefore, uh, they went to the extent of uh, actually alienating themselves from the freedom struggle and uh, aligning with the British power. And therefore, uh, by the time the country was getting independent, uh, their influence uh, uh, on the process uh, of, of the constitution making uh, when when uh, we were uh, we had uh, become uh, independent uh, was was uh, very very minor and and in fact uh, our constitutional framework itself uh, evolved uh, uh, that uh, we will be a, a democratic and secular republic. I mean very clearly uh, distancing and opposing uh, to the idea of. Uh, religious identity-based nation. Uh, and, and that uh, basis had sustained all these years. Uh, but what's, what has happened because of the uh, overall weakness of the left in the political process, the right uh, emerged uh, in, 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 to, a, to a great extent uh, to, to uh, uh, as a, as a, as a Counterposer uh, to the crisis that was actually uh, getting aggravated uh, under the neoliberal dispensation, which, along with the global process, uh, was uh, very much, uh, uh, how to say, uh, was was uh, very pronounced in our economic uh, policy making as well as our uh, policy from the. Uh, beginning of the 90s itself. And uh, now we have reached a stage where uh, actually most of the other, uh, uh, even non-left forces are getting marginalized because uh, this uh, rise of the right wing has brought about uh, three major changes uh, in uh, the way uh, politics functions in India. One is the uh, nature of the neoliberal uh, policies that are being pursued is of a far more uh, aggressive uh, uh, dimension and magnitude uh, in so far as it is virtually handing over not just the public assets uh, which had been created assiduously over the years, but even the natural resources are actually being handed over to uh, certain uh, cronies uh, of the regime. And uh, along with what we are seeing uh, elsewhere in the globe, you have seen that what disaster it would spell uh, in the huge landslide that we had uh, in one of our uh, northernmost uh, mountainous state, 
So therefore, I mean, uh, rampant uh, 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 this uh, exploitation of the natural resources is actually creating a great problem. And this is one of the major features of the uh, kind of uh, neoliberal uh, uh, policy regime that we are having. The second question, of course, is also uh, something which is uh, typical uh, to India, that is the uh, Hindutva political process. Now, uh, people tend to, uh, or, or people fail to recognize uh, the difference between uh, Hinduism as a, a religious construct and uh, Hindutva, uh, which is essentially a political project. I mean, the Hindutva's uh, advocates themselves uh, claim that, uh, in fact, they have nothing to do with religion, but uh, essentially, uh, their project is to uh, capture political power. Uh, but of course, uh, associated uh, issues that they bring up, it becomes very clear that they uh, want to make uh, a very, very brazen use of uh, religious sentiments. And uh, because uh, Hindus as uh, a, a, a religious identity uh, is more than 80% of the people. So basically what they are trying to do is to convert the entire uh, society and polity uh, into a majoritarian project. And uh, this is being facilitated uh, by the uh, spearhead of the Hindutva forces, which is uh, RSS, which was created in 1925, uh, almost at the same time when the Communist Party was formed. And uh, it is uh, they who have been uh, uh, around and over the years through uh, twists and turns have actually uh, shaped this process of uh, Hindutva uh, consolidation and now uh, they are in power uh, not just at the national level but also in a large number of states as a result of which they are in fact subverting the um, structures of state power and not just executive or the legislature uh, but even the uh, judiciary cannot re remain unaffected by the process that they have uh, continued. And of course, the third strand is a very clear and more proximate convergence with uh, uh, imperialism of the times, uh, led by US imperialism. And of course, what we see in, uh, say, for example, the Ukraine war, uh, the uh, growing proximity uh, of, of uh, much of the uh, much of Europe and and the NATO, uh, therefore uh, India uh, under under the current regime uh, is putting itself uh, in the uh, camp of uh, these forces, and therefore one of the major agenda is to dovetail uh, with the uh, uh, U.S. foreign policy game plan of. Uh, not just containing, but isolating China, and therefore the renaming of uh, even uh, our uh, continental references from Asia Pacific to Indo Pacific and so on and so forth. And uh, this also uh, brings uh, India very close to Israel. As you know, the Zionist movement there and the Hinduto mm, movement here have a very uh, long-standing uh, relationship. And uh, it, was, it was not just symbolic that uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi, uh, when he visited this tribe, uh, he uh, went to pay obeisance to the uh, founder of the uh, Zionist movement. And um, that also gives them a sort of tactical advantage in uh, teaming up in, uh, in terms of uh, acquiring uh, military uh, and intelligence software. 
because uh, the entire process naturally uh, is uh, uh, actually bringing in the uh, unprecedented level of attack on democratic rights or human rights uh, and uh, uh, the, the uh, conversion of uh, uh, the Indian society and the Indian state, which uh, was, was uh, essentially quite open uh, uh, in the uh, post-independence uh, period into a full-fledged surveillance state. So, and, and uh, actually uh, uh, this uh, proximity to Israel uh, brings uh, a new um, zing, uh, so to say, uh, in this uh, Indian uh, security establishment. So these three aspects coming together have created this condition. So it is in this background that uh, when we as the Indian left uh, uh, try to fight back uh, the regime, uh, one of the major aspects has to be to oppose the uh, unprecedented proximity of uh, Indian uh, foreign policy establishment uh, with imperialism. So it, it, is, it comes naturally as part of our own national battle. Now, uh, it is in this background we are taking on and we are pointing out, but uh, as a huge country, India is also having its contradictions or uh, rather uh, it's, it's uh, coming into conflict at times with the kind of uh, uh, policy fallouts of uh, what uh, imperialism is trying to uh, pursue in the current point in time. As you know, India is, uh, uh, after China, it is one of the uh, largest uh, uh, energy importers and, and it uh, mostly imports uh, the oil and gas. Uh, therefore, on the one hand, uh, it is very, very close to US uh, and NATO, but at the same time, uh, it, it cannot pay through its nose for importing uh, the uh, oil and gas uh, without uh, shunning, shunning the uh, cheaper uh, Russian uh, energy. So therefore, you had a strange situation where on the one hand, uh, they were enjoying their proximity to uh, US imperialism. But on the other hand, in the United Nations, they were staying neutral in that uh, whole question of uh, um, this uh, restrictions uh, over uh, Russian uh, exports. So uh, therefore, uh, this uh, kind of uh, uh, strange uh, and bizarre developments actually are uh, punctuating the general drift of the Indian foreign policy uh, towards uh, imperialism. And uh, therefore, uh, uh, we are also, when we build uh, this uh, uh, people's uh, uh, alliance sort of uh, in defending the uh, rights of the people, their life and livelihood. In fact, the economy is in shambles and we have uh, we've seen the latest uh, Oxfam report that uh, uh, India is not just replicating the model of uh, uh, growing inequality that is there globally, but uh, India, uh, for, the, for India, the level of uh, inequality, uh, it is, it is uh, uh, stupendous and uh, uh, that is affecting um, uh, the Indian people, particularly the poor sections. Now, even the Food and Agricultural uh, Organization have uh, recognized that 98% of the Indian population, they are not having uh, uh, proper uh, levels of nutrition in their food. I mean, uh, the, the uh, poverty, situation of poverty, of hunger, and all this uh, indexing that happens shows that on these basic uh, uh, aspects of human life, uh, India is in a, in a very bad shape. The question of unemployment has grown as we are seeing elsewhere in the world also, that uh, working class actions are there. 
here also, uh, along with the working class, there is a huge peasantry which is dependent on agriculture. Uh, they also had a big battle where they forced uh, the government to withdraw some of the pro-corporate legislations that were initiated. So uh, it is in this background that we have uh, tried to uh, adopt a certain uh, position on the uh, Ukraine uh, development. Now we are uh, we are uh, clearly aware uh, of uh, things that has uh, that has been happening in uh, Eastern Europe and erstwhile uh, Soviet uh, republics of the Soviet Union, erstwhile Soviet Union. Now, uh, it was uh, clear that uh, uh, as and when Soviet Union collapsed and uh, socialist governments in uh, Eastern Europe also uh, disappeared, uh, and, and uh, there was a uh, natural withering away of the uh, Warsaw uh, Treaty. Uh, I mean, the justification of uh, continuation of uh, NATO was just not there. But because of the uh, balance of or, or correlation of uh, political forces at the international level, NATO and uh, US not only continued, but they stepped up their offensive. Uh, and as a result of that, we have seen that uh, what was uh, claimed uh, uh, at the time of Cold War, that uh, once uh, Cold War disappears, uh, people will get the peace revision, but nothing like that has happened. On the contrary, the absence of uh, uh, Cold War has emboldened uh, US uh, and NATO, and their assurance to Gorbachev uh, uh, that, that uh, NATO will not uh, uh, extend towards the East uh, has gone through the window. And uh, we had seen earlier flashpoints in Georgia and elsewhere. And then this um, new so-called uh, quote-unquote uh, revolutions uh, in Ukraine, which uh, really meant uh, the takeover of uh, uh, neo-fascist forces, uh, as we saw in Ukraine. So it definitely was uh, putting pressures on uh, Russian security concern, but uh, I must be very uh, clear, having having uh, said that, that we uh, we were very clear from the very beginning that uh, war is in no way going to help uh, uh, de-escalate the situation, and and uh, war in the present times cannot be a solution uh, to lasting problems or the. Uh, security imbalances that exist. Uh, therefore, we were opposed that way uh, to the war, but at the same time, uh, we are thoroughly opposed to the uh, one-dimensional uh, narrative that uh, is dominating the West, that it is a confrontation between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, it is definitely not, and uh, Ukraine just happens to be the theater of uh, confrontation uh, between US and NATO uh, on the one hand uh, and Russia. And uh, therefore uh, we are seeing, what we are seeing is the uh, protraction of uh, the uh, military conflict in Ukraine, uh, largely because of the huge uh, resources, financial resources, uh, military hardware, uh, mercenaries that is being pumped uh, into Ukraine. And uh, now that is being also officially admitted by uh, most of the accounts that we get from uh, United States or uh, European uh, sources that the amount of... And, and it appears to us that, uh, in fact, uh, uh, U.S. also sees that uh, this... Uh, uh, military confrontation as a uh, way uh, to, to overcome their own economic crisis. I mean, this has uh, been done in the past. Now it is being reenacted by using war 
uh, and and uh, expenditure on on military uh, hardware uh, as as a, a solution to to uh, at least uh, uh, partially mitigate mitigate their own domestic economic problems. Uh, therefore, we don't uh, see uh, any immediate uh, resolution of of uh, uh, the the conflict in Ukraine. But at the same time, I mean, this again shows uh, the, the uh, inhuman and uh, uh, unreasonable uh, uh, approach of uh, these uh, countries. Because you see, it, Ukraine is one of the biggest granaries and, and uh, everybody is recognizing that the uh, global inflation that the world uh, faces today, particularly inflation of uh, uh, food uh, items uh, that is affecting the poorest and and the uh, working people of the world, but but they are just oblivious of uh, those those uh, uh, ramifications and uh, they carry on the war. Therefore, I think uh, we are at the same time uh, taking up while while uh, we we uh, fight the policies of our own government uh, the way they are actually. Uh, fueling uh, inflationary spirals in our country. I mean, I will give you a small example that uh, whereas in the last three weeks, uh, international crude oil prices have come down, but uh, in our country, the retail price of uh, uh, petroleum, gasoline, and uh, so on and so forth, cooking gas, uh, it is not coming down. Uh, on the contrary, the government is raising uh, resources uh, from uh, fuel taxes, and and that is uh, uh, putting further pressure on the uh, livelihood conditions of our people. So while uh, we uh, raise questions about those things, we are also uh, uh, are critical of our government's failure to articulate these concerns. Um, uh, and and uh, put pressure on uh, on on uh, uh, U.S. and and uh, uh, NATO uh, for for uh, creating a condition or contributing towards the uh, protraction of the military conflict. I think that is the general framework on which we are functioning. Uh, our basic approach is to rally the Indian people because we know that the Indian state is loaded in favor of the policies that I have uh, just outlined. Uh, therefore, uh, unless we can uh, bring uh, people uh, and their uh, assertion into play, I mean, the conditions of the Indian people uh, cannot change. And uh, in this, uh, we think that, that uh, Indian uh, people's uh, fight for uh, their, their just uh, necessities of life and livelihood is intrinsically linked with uh, the, the uh, anti-imperialist and the progressive forces of the world. I mean, we cannot do it in isolation. So uh, it is from that standpoint uh, that uh, we uh, express our concerns on the continuing conflict. Uh, I think that that's about all I wanted to speak as part of my opening remarks. I will be open to all questions. Okay. Um, first of all, Comrade, thanks a lot for uh, taking our time and being here with us today. And thanks a lot for your very uh, informative uh, introduction into this topic, which uh, <clears throat> I feel is quite big and it's quite difficult to uh, delve into the depth of uh, the issues in such a short time, but I find it very interesting and important uh, to understand the challenges of the Indian Communist movement or challenges of the Indian working class today to understand CPM's position on on uh, the con uh, on the conflict in Ukraine and the Modi government's position towards that. I have uh, broadly two questions for you, uh, and a lot of it refers to the points you've already mentioned. 
I would, for my first question, I would like to pick up the two of the three points that you mentioned about the changes in the Indian politics. One is the nature of uh, increasing new liberal politics in India. And the second is the proximity of proximate uh, convergence uh, of the Indian bourgeoisie with the US led imperialism. What I'm trying to understand here is that, uh, do you see uh, the Indian bourgeoisie and the, and the US imperialism as a homogeneous entity, or is it possible for, for you or for the Indian working class movement to, 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 to make a, how do you say, a differentiation between these two entities and build their strategy and tactic in relation to that? In my interaction with the comrades from CPIM in the last several one, months, what I've, what I've wanted to ask the comrades uh, or the CPIM is, uh, for, uh, the, for the Communist Party India Marxist, who is the main enemy of the Indian working class? Would you say it is the Indian working class and the Indian masses? Would you say that it is the Indian bourgeoisie who's the main enemy? Or would you say that it's the US-led imperialist forces who is the main enemy against whom the Indian working class has to divert all of its forces uh, and its strategy and tactic. Um, the background of this question is the US led, for me, uh, is the US led uh, new liberal onslaught on the Indian masses and the new colonial uh, exploitation of countries like India and the global South countries. Uh, and uh, in this, for me, to make my question more concrete is uh, the question is, uh, is uh, the question of national sovereignty, defending the national sovereignty, still very much a question uh, of uh, extreme relevance and prominence for CPIM today. Uh, and second uh, is the question, my second question goes in the direction of Modi government's uh, position toward the war. Uh, as I understand it, becoming increasingly uh, dual character. You, I think you explained us very well how uh, on the one hand, India has been aligning strongly with the US imperialist interest over the last three decades, especially uh, increasing economic and military ties uh, in US's uh, aggression towards China and other uh, bilateral multilateral alliances such as Quad and such. But on the other hand, in its uh, support uh, towards Russia, uh, I also see India taking a big lead in uh, forming uh, a non U.S. dominated, a very strong non-U.S. dominated economic bloc uh, globally. And here I would like to ask you, uh, for you, is there, is there a, a, a progressive element in Indian government's, uh, Indian government's dual character foreign policy? Or would you say that overall it, it, ha it is regressive, uh, there are regressive characters as prominently it is aligning itself to the interest of the of the US led imperialism. I think for now I have these questions, maybe you can uh, talk about it a bit and then we can open it up for uh, the rest of the people here. Uh, I think uh, uh, it is uh, too much to expect that there is a uh, progressive uh, element that has come into Indian foreign policy making. Uh, as they say, uh, discretion is the better part of valor. So it is uh, very, very, uh, uh, it sounds very romantic uh, to, to be progressive in opposing or at least not uh, completely aligning with the US policies of uh, sanctions and all that. Uh, but this is essentially a tactical response. You see, Indian economy is in such a mess and Indian economy is so much dependent on energy resources. Uh, I think uh, nobody in the right frame of mind uh, would, be, would be creating a bigger problem for themselves uh, by uh, going for a far more uh, expensive, prohibitively expensive uh, imports uh, from uh, other sources and, and uh, just shun uh, whatever Russian uh, offers them. And uh, there, another uh, uh, interesting development is taking place, not just India, also China, that uh, there's a increasing tendency because you see, uh, dollar is uh, seen as a major uh, instrument of uh, 
hegemony in international finances. So a uh, large number of economies, uh, including India and China, uh, along with Russia, uh, they are uh, toying with the idea of uh, switching over from a dollar uh, denominated trade uh, to, to uh, actually uh, uh, have an exchange based on their or own national uh, currencies. That is a, a tendency which is emerging quite uh, prominently. But uh, we wouldn't call this uh, actually a progressive uh, uh, resurgence of a progressive orientation or a resurgence of uh, what was known as the non-aligned movement in terms of foreign policy. Uh, in the uh, earlier years of uh, India's existence uh, as an independent republic. Um, we won't say that there is a convergence between uh, imperialism and uh, Indian corporates. See, today the nature of capitalism is such that uh, finance capital is the uh, major feature of uh, uh, imperialist, capitalist uh, economy. Therefore, uh, there will be a certain degree of uh, uh, integration between uh, uh, global finance and Indian uh, corporate finance. And, and uh, uh, Indian uh, corporates also uh, cannot remain aloof to or, or uh, insulated from uh, the movement of the uh, global finances. So, no, no. To that extent, there is uh, definitely some coming together of uh, uh, Indian corporate uh, capital uh, and uh, global uh, financial capital. Uh, but uh, to, to say that as, uh, say for example, the ultra left uh, in our country uh, termed this uh, as, as a, um, how to say, um, as, as neo-colonialism, and uh, surrender to neocolonial and, and Indian capital itself is off the door. Uh, I think uh, we have come a long way from that. That is not the situation. We are independent, but that independence is coming under increasing strain uh, because of the nature of the regime on the one hand and because of the uh, uh, nature of uh, the, the uh, finance capital driven uh, developments that are taking place globally. I would uh, like to uh, make that point very, very clear. Uh, so uh, this is, I think the situation that, but our emphasis is to link our own struggle uh, for, for uh, the, the realization of uh, better uh, livelihood conditions for uh, the Indian uh, working people, the, the uh, working class, the peasantry, and uh, other sections of democratic sections of the society uh, with the uh, uh, simultaneous struggle against uh, uh, imperialist policies, which are also uh, aggravating uh, the condition of our people. So, uh, to, to that extent, I mean, uh, there is uh, some kind of a, how, how to say, intersection between uh, policies uh, of uh, the Indian corporates and uh, international uh, global finance. Okay, the first question uh, from the audience will be raised by uh, Robin. You have the word now. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> so, uh, if I may, I, I would I have more of a comment, and uh, very respectfully, I would like to disagree with 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 comrade uh, in that. So, I think comrade Sajidit also raised the question that uh, you know what is the, the the characteristic? How is the Modi government approaching Ukraine and foreign policy? And I think uh, I don't think there's a progressive element. In, in, in the Modi government foreign policy, but certainly given how uh, the way they have withstood pressure from the West, 
to 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 keep on buying oil from Russia. For example, by the way, there's been studies now conducted. Actually, the 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 lower cost from Russia is just about two dollars per barrel uh, over a ten month period, which comes to around two billion rupees, which is not much in in the overall context. Yet we have continued to buy that uh, at a time when people, for example, uh, Lula, who who many consider in the Latin American left a a, a member of the world sort of left movement, has actually mm-hmm. condemned Russia. uh the modi government has refused to do so are they progressive absolutely not but i think the contradiction of imperialism and the declining role of the us is allowing them to play this pragmatic role where they are actually trying to promote alternate system of payment they are trying to promote alternate system of governance uh so i think there's that and i think indian capital to that extent uh, given its growth uh, also party led to Uh, the Modi government's neoliberal onslaught is, to some extent, appearing as a competitor, which is why, in recent events, you've had, for example, the the Hindenburg report. Now, Adani, as a enterprise and as a as a setup, is, of course, we every every Indian, even BJP supporters, know it, is hand in glove with the Modi government. Is also horribly in debt. Uh, but the the timing of the report and the attack, together with comments from people such as George Soros. do indicate i think that foreign capital is seen and the modi government to some extent even if pre- under pressure from for example its own wings uh, has taken some steps to limit the the entry of foreign capital again are they against foreign capital no but they are simply pragmatic enough to understand what for example previous governments did not which is that opening india itself up completely to the west is a disaster for india which which is what happened uh and i think secondly on the point of uh russia my i, I would really like to say at least uh, i mean i'm i'm not uh, comment basu basu much seen as any so i will not uh, perhaps my words will be like taken less lightly but to me it seems that the what russia did if you were to recognize that in nato expansion is an issue then as comment lenin said communists are not pacifists so you must analyze a, a war on its cl- class basis and understand what the correct position is and to that extent i believe that the the russia had no option and so it is not just uh, no one wants war it is terribly terribly debilitating for everyone involved uh, ukraine is wrecked i think for the near future as uh, whatever happens from here on now but to me it seems absolutely correct to support russia to say that no this this will not go any further i'll stop there for now thank you uh well i i uh, respect disagreement because uh, we are operating in an atmosphere where uh, disagreements are being criminalized therefore i i definitely uh, appreciate uh, your uh, disagreement but i think you have to go into the uh, actual uh, uh, the Uh, details of uh, the modi government's economic policy i think uh, you are really uh, hoping too much uh, as uh, modi government has having taken a uh, solidly uh, pro sovereign uh, position and and uh, trying to uh, consolidate uh, india's independence on the other hand our main charge is that india is not taking an independent position this have its economy this have its foreign policy you see what is happening is basically a knee jerk uh, reaction because of the dire conditions of the indian economy and if you are talking about uh, adani as the uh, harbinger of uh, independent uh, indian industrial development Uh, i would uh, say that uh, the facts speak otherwise you see it's it's uh, a cronyism of a different level uh, now now most of the ports most of the airports uh, uh, roads uh, all major uh, public asset in the infrastructure sector has been handed over in a platter secondly if you look at the why hindenburg uh, report had uh, such a big impact uh, 
in the uh, capital market and uh, in uh, Indian uh, uh, polity as such is uh, not because uh, it is being backed by George Soros. See, it is primarily because most of these things, if you look at Hindenburg report, it does not bring about bring out any new facts. These were available. If you if you see the entire report, this is mostly culled out from material, uh, which which uh, were were uh, right there, and and uh, they have just collected. And some of the people who have worked, I mean, uh, Hindenburg uh, research has also uh, admitted that, uh, say, for example, Poronjoy Gota absolutely left people uh, who uh, had made disclosures, but they have been hounded by the government all these years. Uh, the uh, main uh, 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 capital market regulator was deactivated Bhatkani. And uh, now that there is so much of pressure, the, the stock exchanges and the regulators and the central bank are, but still, the Modi government is not prepared to uh, institute an inquiry into the dealings of Adani. So, see, I, I mean, it's it's bizarre. Adani's position was 609 in the global wealth list when, when Modi came to power. And it went up to the second position uh, by the end of 2022. So, Modi in projecting Modi, in, in selling Modi's uh, uh, so-called Gujarat model for coming to power, uh, uh, largely Adani was uh, instrumental. You know, what was the role that Adani played in reformation Modi's uh, uh, image uh, in the aftermath of the uh, unprecedented communal violence in Gujarat in 2002? Therefore, I think uh, that is uh, a very, very simplistic uh, uh, analysis uh, that by, by uh, equating this at, uh, attack by Hindenburg as uh, the attack of uh, uh, US and American uh, capitalism on, on the Modi government. On the contrary, they are quite uh, uh, aware what is happening. And Therefore, just because, say, for example, uh, BBC does a documentary on what happened in Gujarat and uh, Modi's role in that, if you equate that as West's attack on Modi, I think that will be unfair because we have to go into the content of the critique uh, that is being uh, made about Modi and its uh, economic policy. And therefore, uh, uh, I think uh, that uh, from the standpoint of the uh, Indian left, I mean, we can never accept. On the contrary, I mean, they are, Modi has totally integrated. Now, uh, you see the kind of military relation that the Modi government is promoting with US, uh, with Israel. I mean, how could one imagine <coughs> that Modi is trying to Consolidate uh, Indian uh, independent uh, position <coughs> in global economy and uh, global uh, uh, foreign uh, relations. So, I think I think uh, that would be uh, uh, not be uh, uh, realistic uh, and not be uh, a proper and uh, studied uh, nuanced. Uh, analysis of what is happening in India. Mm -hmm. I think next question. Um, would you say something, Satya? Uh, yeah, I think I just want to say that before Rajguru, there is a question already in the chat from someone from ER. <coughs> you can. Yeah, I would uh, quickly um, read out uh, what was posted in the chat, and the question is. Are the enterprises which are privatizing the national resources of India mainly Indian or foreign? How does uh, how do you see the conflicts between national and foreign capital inside India? 
I think uh, we have, as a party, Communist Party of India, Marxists, uh, always uh, uh, believed in that uh, Leninist analysis that uh, Indian uh, bourgeoisie, uh, especially Indian big bourgeoisie, uh, has a dual character. And uh, in the sense that uh, when uh, uh, at times it uh, does confront imperialism, but uh, uh, they often collaborate with uh, uh, foreign finance capital. And uh, in the case of the present government, uh, it is a, a greater emphasis on the later, that is uh, collaboration that we are seeing. Now the privatization that is taking place is essentially uh, that of public sector assets and also our natural resources, uh, which is happening. So uh, uh, not, uh, I mean, I mean, till now, uh, Indian, uh, yes, uh, that what the earlier questioner was saying. Yes, earlier governments also, uh, policies to open up the economy. But if you look at the uh, actual quantum of foreign investments that have taken place or the assets that have been uh, created uh, through infusion of foreign capital is uh, not that uh, uh, of that magnitude. So basically in privatization, what we are seeing is uh, the, the uh, handing over of uh, uh, Indian resources, essentially. Uh, 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 and and uh, that uh, is what is happening here. Okay, next question is by Rayaguru Selvaraj. You can talk now. Uh, hi. It, it is horrible. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. So, uh, comrade, my question is, uh, the Indian fascists are entering into the Europe. So I saw one post from Frankfurt uh, when VHP was celebrating the Republic Day in Frankfurt. Uh, so VHP was deep rooted here in Frankfurt. So in the name of NGOs. So you know all these, uh, you, you know all these, that, that uh, first enemy of the RSS, uh, Indian fascist group is communist. Uh, they are all over the Europe and deep rooted. They are inviting many RSS supporters from India to Europe as a Hindus. So this will be threat for the working class. This is my first question. Second question is, it's uh, out to India. Uh, you know the Samgal, who the institution is for the administration studies in India. They are inviting uh, many students for the IAS, IPS studies freely. They are investing on the students. Uh, this will be the most dangerous one for the Indian administration when they are in their own ideology, if they come for the people's service in the administration, this will be the threat for the uh, whole entire administration, right? Even if you say in India or Tamil Nadu, I belongs to Tamil Nadu. So if you see the administration, uh, it won't work right. Uh, like a fascist, they work for the fascist and even the IAS people is not work for the People's demand, they work for that union government, central government demands, right? These are the two questions I have to ask. We are, we are acutely aware of the uh, manner in which RSS functions. And uh, that is why from the outset, we have been saying, and uh, I must also uh, put this on record, that in 2000, uh, when in the background of the international changes uh, and the changes in the manner of functioning of uh, uh, finance-led capitalism and the kind of uh, consolidation of communal forces that were taking place in India, we had updated our party program. And in that uh, updated uh, party program, we had clearly marked that uh, in India, the Bharti Janta Party, uh, is different from all other political parties, uh, non-left political parties, um, in this because it is being uh, run by, it is uh, being controlled by the RSS. As you know, that RSS is a full-fledged fascist organization. In fact, 
the relationship uh, dates back uh, uh, to the days of Hitler and Mussolini. In fact, some of the uh, first generation uh, RSS ideologues, uh, they had visited Germany and Italy. And now it is well established in terms of historical research. So that fascist tendency is there. But the change that we are seeing today that what they were doing as a movement from uh, without, without uh, having access to state power has completely changed after 2014 uh, with the uh, ascension of uh, uh, Modi government. And uh, this has become uh, further dangerous uh, following the 2019 Lok Sabha elections where they have now got a majority, they control uh, the, the, uh, both the houses at the national level. They uh, appoint all the governors, uh, like the comrade who was speaking from uh, Tamil Nadu, who must be uh, knowing that uh, apart from Kerala, uh, the Tamil Nadu government, we have managed to uh, really bring together uh, secular uh, forces, democratic forces, and the government is taking consistently uh, uh, anti-BJP, anti-Modi government position, but that the governor is creating uh, problems for the uh, uh, legitimately elected state government. So we are aware of this and we are uh, also trying to devise our own ways uh, of uh, counteracting uh, these kind of moves by RSS because uh, what is happening is, you see, the uh, formal uh, structures of the uh, uh, secular and democratic constitution remains uh, in its uh, uh, facade, but internally they are trying to subvert the uh, uh, constitution and convert this into a majoritarian, sectarian, uh, Hindutva, uh, Rashtra, state. And uh, therefore, uh, therefore, one of the major essence of uh, our battle today is to defend the Indian constitution. I mean, not in the sense of uh, uh, the, the uh, bourgeois uh, democratic uh, uh, constitution that it is formally, but in the sense of uh, uh, defending the inclusive nature and the uh, composite nature of the uh, Indian society and the Indian constitution. Um, I'd like to, like to ask the members of the audience to keep the questions a little bit pointed towards CPM's assessment of uh, Russia and its, uh, uh, its military inter intervention in Ukraine. Um, I have a question next. Um, uh, as part of the, at least in Germany, as part of the, as part of the uh, assessment of communist movement about Russia's actions and what Russia is today, uh, there is a strong, uh, strong uh, stream which, uh, which claims uh, that uh, as the monopoly capital, as the monopolies have risen up, risen up in most of the countries around the world. Uh, that would mean that most of the countries around the world are imperialist. That's why they would characterize, for example, Russia as imperialist, or they would also characterize India as imperialist. And here I would like to ask, uh, how do you see India today? I see very strong monopolies in India with already uh, these monopolies exporting uh, definitely large amounts of capital. I'm not sure if the export of capital has taken prominence over export of goods. But uh, would you say that there is uh, there is uh, a finance dominance of finance capital in India, and would you say that India is an imperialist country itself because there are monopolies in India? I think uh, I mean we we have uh, understood uh, Marxism Leninism uh, based on the readings of Marx and Lenin, and of course our own experience of dealing with it over the years. We have, we have dealt with the uh, British imperialism for 200 years. Uh, we find this very strange because you see imperialism does not uh, 
uh, how to say, uh, imply only economic questions or, or uh, financial questions. Uh, uh, there are certain uh, uh, political aspects which are also uh, key to understand uh, imperialism. So for that matter, any country exporting and uh, selling uh, their, their uh, goods and services in other countries would be termed imperialism, if, if uh, that be so. Uh, I think that is a very wrong way of uh, understanding, uh, far less describing uh, capitalism. I mean, of course, India is a capitalist country. Russia is a capitalist country. Nobody should have any illusion about that. But every capitalist country is not an imperialist country. Not every capitalist economy is an imperialist economy. I mean, that also uh, one should understand. And I was, as I was saying that today, there is a certain uh, degree of uh, global nature in, in the uh, way uh, finance capital functions. Therefore, uh, to, to that extent, uh, there is a, a bit of uh, global uh, in every every capital in every country. So I think, but to confuse this as imperialist capital, I think would be really uh, missing the uh, free for the woods. Um. I do not see the next two questions uh, quite uh, directly relevant for our discussion. I would ask uh, other people here uh, to if they have any questions. Uh, and, and let me tell you that this is the analysis of some of the communist parties. Uh, and we have good relations with some of them, like the Communist Party of Greece, for example. Uh, we have sharp differences with uh, this kind of uh, analysis that they put forth at times. Yeah. Oh, okay, now you can hear me. Uh, okay, thanks a lot, first of all, for your uh, input, which uh, I find is really uh, interesting for us, and we will need to uh, go deeper um, in many of the questions that you've already touched. I would like to ask on the concept of uh, uh, multipolarism, if uh, this is something that uh, you've been also discussing in uh, CPIM, and if they, if you see uh, a uh, first of all, uh, what is um, maybe your definition of uh, multipolarism? Because we have uh, all kinds of uh, discussions uh, on it here in the communist movement in Germany. Uh, but also, uh, what kind of uh, maybe progressive element of the overall development of the imperialist system in the world uh, can you uh, uh, maybe po point out? Uh, yeah. I think uh, in the uh, post-Cold War situation, uh, the uh, natural uh, outcome of uh, uh, the, the end of Cold War uh, would be an uh, emergence of uh, multipolarity. But because of the uh, fact that the US uh, was the only uh, uh, superpower, uh, that was uh, there uh, in, in the global landscape. Therefore, they tried to convert that situation uh, into one of unipolarity. But at the same time, uh, there were new contradictions that were coming. I mean, uh, uh, you see, uh, uh, for example, that uh, famous uh, speech by Putin that uh, in the uh, security conference in Munich, where he first pointed out uh, his open opposition uh, to some of the foreign policy uh, underpinnings of uh, US. Uh, that was, I think, about uh, two decades back. 
So naturally, today imperialism uh, does not have the capacity of resolving the problems of uh, global humanity. And as a result of that, uh, contradictions will come. And uh, those contradictions always offer opportunities for uh, progressive and anti-imperialist uh, forces to intervene. You see, the question is, today's uh, world is dominated by forces which are uh, inimical to the interests of the working class and other working people. So, so in that kind of a situation, if there is a single center, if there is a single pole which is dominating uh, the, the uh, global processes, I think uh, there the working class and other uh, sections of the working people will not have the possibility of intervening and converting uh, those uh, uh, differences and those uh, uh, conflicts <coughs> to secure the interests of the working people. I mean, I mean the, in that sense, we are, uh, we are, are always, uh, we, we prefer uh, a situation where a certain degree of uh, uh, multipolar uh, uh, conflicts that remain uh, in in uh, place of uh, unipolar uh, domination and hegemony. Um, if you have um, any concerns in talking English, you can also raise your questions in uh, German and we can translate them. That's not a problem. So if you have a question, but uh, you cannot uh, say it in English, uh, just say it in German and we will translate it. And next one is uh, Locke. I hope. I can be understood clearly. I think I have a problem with my microphone, but um, anyways, are you uh, okay? Perfect. You mentioned um, that um, you have uh, some differences um, in the assessment of whether uh, certain countries are imperialist or not. You mentioned the uh, Communist Party of Greece, and I wonder um, um, how do you um, uh, is this a uh, um, uh, discussion that uh, takes uh, place publicly, uh, and um, what what do you think? Uh, how how should the communist um, international movement deal with such um, differences? Because, um, for example, that um, I I have the feeling or I have the impression that um, many uh, topics are um, uh, still um, uh, uh, out of, I guess, uh, fear of um, <clears throat> uh, losing uh, a relationship or something, are uh, try to uh, keep behind closed doors. And uh, I wonder, um, what's your take on uh, how to deal with such differences? How should they um, be um, uh, approached? Uh, I agree with you. I mean, uh, there should be an attempt to uh, try and see that differences uh, are resolved at the bilateral level. Uh, we have uh, uh, very good uh, relations with the Communist Party of Greece. But to exemplify that point, what Satyajit was making about uh, uh, Russia being an imperialist power or India being an imperialist power, as a matter of fact, I was stating that uh, yes, uh, Communist Party of Greece's position is that uh, Russia is imperialist. And uh, of course, we have this uh, uh, international uh, working group process uh, where a number of uh, uh, Communist parties and workers' parties, uh, we meet uh, annually, we discuss issues, we uh, agree on certain themes, uh, and uh, that process is on. Therefore, <coughs> that is a forum uh, where we are trying to, because we think that uh, the uh, communist uh, international uh, in the old sense uh, will not be very effective in addressing uh, 
mutual differences that we have. Uh, therefore, uh, I mean, we have to depend more on uh, bilateral and uh, multilateral arrangements to uh, address questions and also uh, to, to try and uh, locate the areas of agreement that we could possibly have, uh, solidarity actions and all that. Um, that is the way we have to function because ultimately you see so many factors are coming in uh, to, to for the, for the uh, working of the communist and the left in uh, each of these uh, concrete conditions in which we are working. I think uh, even well-meaning uh, friends and comrades uh, may not understand the uh, nuances that uh, uh, one has to uh, confront with uh, in a particular country. And uh, it, is, it, is, it is very natural, therefore, to think of a center which will uh, really provide a framework for uh, how to look at uh, issues, ideological or political, uh, I think that would be really, really uh, very um, hazardous uh, uh, situation. Okay, next one is uh, Simon. Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you for the opportunity that we can ask you questions. Um, I'm gonna ask the question in German, uh, so if that's okay. Um, meine Frage ist, die Kommunistische Partie Indiens uh, spricht sich für uh, den Frieden aus und dass die äh, kriegerischen Handlungen aufhören. Die Frage dabei, äh, die ich mir stelle, ist, welche Bedingungen sollten bei Friedensverhandlungen äh, rauskommen? Welche sind realistisch und welche Bedingungen für Friedensverhandlungen sind progressiv im Kampf gegen den Imperialismus? Bedeutet Entmilitarisierung der NATO oder einfach Frieden, äh, auch wenn die NATO gewinnen sollte in der Ukraine? Also welchen Charakter sollen die Friedensverhandlungen haben? Max, can you translate that? Uh, yes, I will translate it, um, just a second. Um, okay, the comrade um, said that um, um, CPAM um, is uh, pushing for uh, peace in, in the conflict of uh, Russia and Ukraine. And um, his question is, under which um, circumstances um, should be discussed about this piece. So um, can there be um, progressive um, um, circumstances and uh, which character should, um, should, those, um, should those discussions have? I think uh, CPIM is acutely aware of its uh, capacity to influence events. But uh, as a matter of principle, CPIM would never uh, uh, be asking for uh, settling uh, to have peace uh, at the cost of uh, uh, security concerns of Russia, never. And uh, the other is uh, that uh, CPIM is urging uh, everybody concerned because uh, the war is uh, affecting, uh, I think somebody was in the passing remarking that uh, generations of Ukraine will be uh, uh, in, uh, devastated because of this military conflict. But it is not merely a question of Ukraine, but also it's a big question about uh, the, the impact it is having on the global economy of, of the uh, common people across the world, as I was uh, referring to the uh, impact on, say, global food prices and so on and so forth. So, uh, peace is needed for uh, everybody concerned, but it cannot be at the cost of Russian security concerns, because uh, if uh, Russian security concerns had been uh, addressed in the 
first place, there would not be an, uh, such a military conflict that we see today. Okay, Phil will be the next one to ask his question, and afterwards I will read out uh, the question raised by Max in the chat. Yeah, thank you very much for your speech. And uh, my question is, you you uh, you talked about the dual character of the Indian bourgeoisie and the Indian national state right now. And um, my question is, if what do you think, will there be a progressive alliance between India and China? And what does this dual character of the Indian state or Indian bourgeoisie plays a role in this question of um, maybe a coming alliance between um, India and China against USA and uh, the NATO and what do you think is, is it uh, more possibly now in this situation that these kind of um, alliance will come yeah that's uh, we we would be uh, the happiest if uh, India and China uh, comes to take a common position against uh, US imperialism uh, you see but we don't think it is uh, likely uh, at this uh, point in time because the whole concentration of the U.S. Uh, foreign policy intervention is to see uh, India and China divided. Uh, U.S. has managed to uh, rope in India as part of the uh, security alliance, as you know, the Quad, uh, and the military exercises that are taking place. And unfortunately, the uh, reactionary forces uh, within India are also uh, dead against uh, any reconciliation against uh, China uh, on the differences uh, that the two countries are having in terms of the dispute over uh, the definition of their uh, borders. I mean, uh, perhaps India is the only country with which uh, China has major problems of uh, uh, border uh, demarcation. Uh, but uh, actually, it makes sense of uh, uh, India and China uh, making a common cause on uh, the kind of uh, hegemony that U.S. Uh, imperialism is uh, trying to uh, exercise. Uh, but we don't think that it is uh, a, a, any, any, there is any realistic possibility of India and China uh, coming together uh, against uh, US uh, uh, and uh, NATO aggressors at this point in time. The question by Max raised in the chat is um, regarding to this uh, former question and he asked more precisely what can be expected by the Modi government in that matter, so the war from US against China? I think uh, now uh, US uh, sees China as the uh, only major challenge globally, particularly because of the economy and all that, um, that, that uh, China has uh, uh, managed to withstand uh, all the pressures uh, intimidations and they have grown and uh, they are also exerting uh, uh, influence uh, e e on a on, uh, number of countries uh, in uh, Asia, particularly Africa and so many other countries in providing <coughs> relatively cheaper uh, finance and therefore uh, uh, it it uh, is, uh, I mean, working over time to see uh, and undermine uh, the Chinese uh, presence in the uh, global economic and political landscape. Uh, therefore, I, I mean, uh, the, the uh, traditional uh, conflict that India and China uh, had uh, since uh, the border uh, conflicts in 1962. Of course, uh, later on, uh, the uh, relationships uh, 
uh, normalized sort of uh, from the mid 80s uh, but now with the uh, coming of this modi government uh, the uh, conflict is uh, there uh, more on the ideological level against china but what is also very significant that uh, while uh, that border disputes uh, remain uh, modi is not in a position to uh, take on china i mean uh, it is not in favor of uh, escalating the conflict with china uh, much as they are not going to join hands with china in facing us imperialism but on the other hand it also does not want to aggravate uh, the, the relationship uh, with with uh, china Lennart, it's your turn now. Yes, thank you very much, comrade. Um, I want to go back to uh, the question of Ukraine war. Um, you said that um, Russia's security interests must be um, considered um, in any um, peace talks. Um, so that is uh, something significant to be uh, considered. But um, on the other hand, you said that um, the war won't be a solution for um, any security issues of Russia, and um, it is to be uh, opposed. That's how I understand, understood you in your opening remarks. Um, so I wanted to uh, uh, ask you the question, um, um what in in your opinion um what should the uh, russian uh, working class do in this kind of situation uh, on the one hand um there's a war that's um bringing a lot of um pain to the region and also globally uh, that's what you mentioned uh, rising prices and so on but on the other hand uh, you have nato on your border and um really threatening the um national sovereignty of uh, Russia. So um, I find it uh, really uh, difficult um, to give an answer to that. And um, I wanted to ask you uh, what, what your opinion is, what um, Russian working class should do. Um, should they support um, the military uh, operation or should they um, oppose it and um, uh, do what they can against it um, in Russia? Um, what is your uh, opinion on that? I think uh, this has been a, a very major traditional question that uh, working class movements in Europe have faced, uh, even uh, during the First World War. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, it is uh, precisely uh, to, to address that concern and that uh, we had this definition of uh, imperialism coming in from Lenin to demarcate between the interest of the capitalist state uh, and that of the working class and to put uh, the uh, working class on an independent pedestal. So I think uh, that uh, the, the uh, struggle has to be that on the one hand, the Russian working class has to raise the question of uh, the, uh, the uh, kind of hegemony that US imperialism and NATO is trying to impose uh, in dictating uh, the shape of uh, uh, political developments. But at the same time, uh, that uh, this war cannot be, I mean, really uh, finally clinch the issue. I mean, I had also referred to the kind of uh, resources that uh, uh, European economies and the uh, American economy is, is putting in the war. So, so uh, this will be an endless war. I mean, uh, uh, in fact, uh, I mean, it, it, it cannot bring about a, a final solution uh, to this political question. So the Russian uh, working class, of course, has to raise the question of, uh, how to say, uh, the, the uh, hegemony 
uh, that the US and NATO is trying to impose uh, and uh, make Russia uh, fall in line with their uh, game plan. But at the same time, <coughs> the Russian working class cannot possibly, uh, their views cannot converge with that of the uh, Russian capital and the Russian state. I mean, uh, then, then uh, I mean, where does working class stand? But uh, we find also some disturbing tendencies even today that uh, progressive and communist uh, movements uh, do not uh, uh, take cognizance of uh, that entire debate uh, during the First World War and uh, the, the necessity of uh, the respective working class movements of their own countries uh, to eke out an independent path of their own. Alex? Um, <clears throat> if, uh, in order to prepare for this meeting, I have read your uh, your statement on uh, February 25th, so uh, one day after the start of the special military operation. And the title is uh, Ukraine Peace is a Priority. And in the first sentence, you write uh, the CPIM expresses its uh, grave concern at the armed conflict between Russia and Ukraine. It is unfortunate that Russia took military action against Ukraine. Uh, there should be an immediate cessation of armed hostilities and the establishment of peace. Uh, my question to you is um, aimed uh, to the second to the second uh, sentence uh, where you write it's the unfortunate that Russia took military action. What was the uh, alternative for Russia to to act? Because uh, uh, I think uh, that, um, well, in my opinion, uh, there was no other possibility to, to Russia to act because um, the expansion and uh, of NATO and uh, um, the, uh, the, um, the, the more, I can't explain it in English, uh, the Bedrohung der Ukraine, <laughs> durch die Ukraine, um, uh, made it uh, impossible to Russia, for Russia to act. And uh, my question is why you, uh, you write it is unfortunate. And for uh, this, uh, the discussion for today, um, uh, now in Germany, the communist and the peace movement is discussing a lot about um, Verhandlungen. about uh, diplomacy that Russia has to talk with Ukraine. And what do you think, uh, uh, how should be the, uh, um, which, shit, ich kann es nicht erklären, Leute. Also die Frage ist, um, unter welchen Bedingungen die Verhandlungen stattfinden sollen um, und ob man einfach so Verhandlungen fordern kann. Um, the comrade wanted to ask under which uh, circumstances there can be negotiations and um, um, he was referring to the, the threat to Russia um, from the side of Ukraine by NATO, I think. I think uh, the quote itself from that past statement um, actually uh, gives a, a partial uh, representation of the uh, CPIM's view. Uh, that was the opening line. I, I think no communist party anywhere in the world uh, wedged by a capitalist country uh, can give uh, unqualified support uh, to military action. That I think is uh, uh, not acceptable. I mean, at least to us, it is not acceptable. And as I was saying that, you see the events. Now, uh, the 
conflict is uh, more than a year old. If, if uh, that was not uh, uh, the, the only uh, inevitable uh, uh, step, then, I, I mean, uh, this would have been resolved by now. Because I think in today's world, nobody talks of, I mean, uh, years of uh, military conflict. I mean, uh, it is, it is uh, uh, also affecting uh, Russia as much uh, as it is affecting the world. Therefore, see, when you go into a military conflict, you commit yourself in a situation where uh, it's very difficult to retract. Now, to, to create conditions for negotiation, which will uh, include uh, their security concern, I think it becomes all the more difficult. Because in today's situation, without uh, really uh, trying to create a, a global uh, uh, environment and a global uh, uh, political uh, uh, opposition uh, to the unilateralism that uh, US and NATO was displaying vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Eastern Europe and uh, former uh, Soviet republics. Uh, I think uh, to, to go into that kind of conflict, I mean, uh, we cannot say. <coughs> but Russians, <coughs> progressives themselves will have to <coughs> Sorry, we'll have to decide that how far wise and how far effective uh, that step uh, had proved to be uh, in the uh, light of what has happened in the last one year. I think that is what we meant to say that, uh, in fact, uh, going into military uh, uh, a confrontation uh, reduces your options. Uh, in, in uh, addressing uh, a problem that you face. Um, I have a question. I think I'm not able to, Comrade, I'm not able to understand CPIM's position. You also mentioned uh, in, the, in, the, in the statement uh, right after the war, you, you say that uh, uh, the Russian demands for security guarantees, including Ukraine not joining NATO, is legitimate. Uh, CPM says that very clearly. Uh, I think for me, the question is not so much about uh, Russia taking military actions, but, but for me, the question is more about whether Russia was forced into taking an action, uh, forced into taking military actions to defend itself. And I do understand that working class needs to have its own independent position, but when a force as, and of course, I also understand that uh, uh, Russia is a capitalist country and we do not need to, we cannot have any illusions about a progressive nature of the, of the Russian capitalist, Russian bourgeoisie, but when a force like NATO is knocking at your door and, and a threat of, uh, of uh, turning Russia into a colonial, uh, into a colony is very real, how do you, in, 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 and I would also say that Russia has been making a lot of attempts to, to bring peace, uh, to, to resolve this issue through peace and diplomatic channels. However, all I would say the attempts are being stopped by the uh, US-led imperialism. And in such a situation, how, uh, how should the, the working class then respond when it knows that its peace attempts are being stopped? Uh, not, uh, uh, an aggressive force such as NATO is knocking at its, at its door should it then lay down its own arms? I think uh, these are hypothetical questions that you are posing. Uh, point is that you have to look at your tactics that you employ uh, in securing, uh, securing your uh, national sovereignty um, in the overall global context. Today's correlation does not give that advantage to Russia that it can force a positive outcome uh, from its own standpoint by uh, entering into a military engagement. My question is that 
will military engagement produce an outcome which will be in the interest of uh, securing uh, Russia's uh, uh, security concerns and uh, uh, sovereign rights. I mean, let us, let us look from that standpoint. And uh, I don't think that uh, uh, Russia, by uh, entering into that uh, initial uh, military uh, invasion or whatever you say, that uh, has really the, the efforts that they were making, the legitimacy of that efforts uh, have not been reinforced by, by, uh, uh, go, um, by going into that military engagement. You see, therefore, uh, I, I beg to defer, CPIM begs to defer with you on that uh, score, uh, that in today's world, uh, if communists also think that uh, fighting a war is the best option uh, to secure uh, the national interest, uh, I, I, we, unfortunately, we cannot agree with that. Next one is Yannick. Uh, yes, hello. Thanks, first of all, for your speech. Uh, it's really interesting talking with you. I have uh, two questions. Um, first of all, um, I want to know how do you think uh, a possible multipolar world is like a better situation for the Indian working class? I mean, for example, we see some bricks in the world, for example, in Mali, uh, the people in Mali uh, kicked out the French colonialist people, um, which maybe is a, is a yeah, better condition for the Mali working class in a possible multiple, uh, multipolar work. Um, but how is that for the um, Indian working class? Uh, um, I don't know. I don't know if English hinbekomme. Uh, meine Frage ist, ähm, wie eine, eine multipolare Welt die Kampfbedingungen der indischen Arbeiterklasse verbessern könnte. Ähm, und meine andere Frage ist, äh, wenn, wenn es ja für, die, für manche Arbeiterklassen auf der Welt besser ist, in einer multipolaren Welt zu, äh, zu leben, ähm, was ja bedeuten würde, dass wir die US-Hegemonie oder dass die US-Hegemonie abnehmen müsste und die NATO-Hegemonie, ähm, müssten wir da nicht eigentlich für die Niederlage der NATO in der Ukraine kämpfen, was heißt für den Sieg der russischen äh, Föderation in dem Krieg? Okay, I will try to uh, translate uh, those two questions. The first question was, if the um, if a multipolar world will better the situation of the working class in India in its fight against um, imperialism. And second question is, if um, the US hegemony will um, be teared down by multipolarity. Um, and um, uh, the first question is true. Um, so to say that um, a multipolar world is better condition for working class, would that not mean that um, the um, that NATO losing the war will better conditions for working class um, in, in the world? I think uh, I have answered that question. We, we uh, sincerely feel that uh, a multipolar world will be uh, opening up possibilities for the working class uh, to intervene in situations. Uh, if uh, there's a, a unilateral, uh, unipolar and uh, hegemony, Uh, that would be far more difficult, uh, presenting far more difficult uh, circumstances for the working class. And the kind of opportunities we are talking about that would not have come much. 
Now, in so far as uh, the, the emergence of multipolarity, you see in uh, India, before this uh, uh, present uh, alt-right government came in, uh, there were other governments, and, and uh, they were not left governments, but they had uh, started this process of uh, creating blocks. Uh, somebody was referring earlier to blocks and all that. But uh, the block making was actually done much before Modi came into power. The BRICS, uh, Brazil, Russia, um, India, uh, China, and South Africa. And that was seen as a, a major trading block which uh, covered about 60% uh, of the global population and almost 50% of the uh, global trade. And uh, with, with uh, Brazil being there, uh, with uh, China being there, with South Africa being there, uh, and India also uh, being there, uh, I think that question of uh, first part we had a lot of uh, uh, engagement on this whole question of uh, Modi government being the harbinger of uh, 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 independent uh, uh, position of India vis-a-vis -vis US imperialism. But on the contrary, it was the earlier government at that time we were uh, seeing a process uh, unfold. But unfortunately, uh, the, the uh, coming of uh, power by the Modi government itself has undermined that process. That is a fact that has happened. And now again, after the uh, election of uh, Lula in Brazil, uh, talks are beginning. I mean, uh, Modi also uh, happened to have been very close to Bolsonaro. And uh, uh, Modi invited Bolsonaro uh, as the chief guest of our Republic Day celebrations earlier. So uh, that way, I think uh, uh, this uh, actual ground reality of uh, global uh, trade, commerce, economy, finance, et cetera, uh, is giving rise to conditions where uh, countries will have to think about taking uh, positions independent of US independent of NATO to secure its own national interest. But at the same time, since there is no uh, real uh, poll uh, in the uh, world today as uh, it was there uh, at the uh, time of existence of the uh, Soviet Union, uh, uh, this uh, sometimes get uh, disrupted and uh, dissipated. But uh, if <coughs> there is a real multipolar situation, uh, of course, the possibility of uh, countries uh, like India uh, taking a more independent position vis-a-vis uh, -vis imperialism uh, will get reinforced. And in that situation, uh, Indian working class also, we have will have uh, a greater possibility of uh, forcing the Indian government to take that independent position. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, sorry. Um... Thanks. For but 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 uh, I think uh, by what time we we plan to close this? Uh, I think because uh, we are already Indian uh, time. It's already almost nine fifty uh, in the evening. So uh, another ten minutes. Of course, we can continue. Yeah. But, okay. Um. Yeah. Yannick, you can. Yannick. Um, I think you can definitely ask your question and that would be the last, we should make the last question. And there is also the question of question from Surinder Malik. He's the state secretary, CPIM, Bundesland, Haryana. 
and he's also asking uh, something about us. So after Yannick, uh, Yannick uh, asked his question, I would, I would like to ask some comrade from communist organization to tell a little bit about us, uh, what we are doing and why was communist organization formed and a little bit about the situation uh, of the German working class movement. Uh, thank you for your answer. Um, but I think you you have not really answered my second question because when when uh, I completely agree with you that um, the working class have to make an independent uh, policy from the US and uh, but when we want to create a multipolar world, um, we have to fight against the NATO and the US and does that mean automatic or what do you think about uh oh shit my english uh, <laughs> also würde das nicht heißen dass wir für also in dem krieg in der ukraine für die niederlage der nato kämpfen müssen was automatisch ja ein sieg für für die russische föderation bedeuten würde also würde das nicht die bedingung bedingung dafür dass staaten wie indien oder südafrika eine unabhängige politik und Wirtschaft von der USA und von der NATO durchführen könnten, würde das die Bedingungen dafür nicht verbessern. Also auch in Bezug auf die Position von der CPIM, äh, dass der russische, also dass die russische Aggression oder der Krieg eigentlich nicht gut war, also jetzt im Verhältnis zu der multipolaren Welt. Ich hoffe, meine Frage ist so ein bisschen klar geworden. Sorry. Okay. Um, from the point of view of the working class in imperialist countries um, or in, in NATO state countries like uh, Germany, where we are, <clears throat> wouldn't it be our mission to, to fight um, our imperialist states and to fight NATO in order to lose the war to um, better the conditions of um, of uh, working class and to stop um, NATO and US imperialism to drive wars to Russia and uh, China? I think, uh, well, I think it's a more uh, uh, simpler task for, uh, say, German uh, working class movement or uh, uh, some of these uh, working class movements in Europe. Uh, to take on NATO and uh, take on US imperialism. Uh, but the question of uh, uh, working out an independent tactics by say countries like uh, uh, Russia, uh, it's far more complicated in the sense that there is a, a tremendous pressure on the uh, working class movement there, uh, even the communist party in Russia, uh, to side with the uh, or, or, or completely uh, uh, agree with the, the, the Russian government uh, on this question. Uh, but but um, uh, I think uh, for, for the European uh, countries, the working class movement, it's far more easier. Yes, uh, uh, lock, stock and barrel, uh, there has to be opposition to NATO and uh, US aggression. Okay, uh, I think maybe someone uh, can talk a little bit about Kao. Uh, okay, maybe I will uh, take the burden to uh, shortly introduce a little bit about uh, our organization. I'll uh, try to make it uh, short to not uh, uh, put you uh, in too much of a hustle for our meeting. Thanks a lot, first of all, for taking your time. Uh, it's been really, really interesting. And uh, I think we all agree that we have to dive deeper into uh, the um, discussions of the CPIM and the uh, situation of the Indian working class. Uh, movement from which we obviously have so much uh, to learn. The uh, Kommunistische Organisation is uh, a very small uh, organization uh, in Germany that we have founded in 2018 
with the uh, aim of uh, strengthening and rebuilding a unified communist party in Germany on the basis of a clarified political program and the strategy for the German working class. It's nothing uh, new to you in India that uh, uh, the communist movement has to struggle uh, with deeply, uh, deeply <coughs> fragmented uh, movement. The fragmentation in uh, the German communist movement is uh, also a huge problem that we can see. It all, all of course, has a specific historical um, grounding, um, uh, right? Uh, but um, we can see that the German communist movement is in a, a deep uh, crisis, uh, latest since the counter revolution in 1990, and um, that the communist movement is, uh, yeah, uh, deeply detached from the working class who have problems of uh, sectarianism, uh, in general of the stagnation, and as I said, the fragmentation of the communist movement. So what we try to do is not to just uh, call us uh, as, a, as a new uh, communist uh, party, but we uh, try to work with the different uh, organizations, Marxist-Leninist organizations and uh, parties that we can identify in Germany and also around the world to um, develop a, a, a strategy of the uh, international working class and also of the working class in Germany that is able to confront uh, the um, current position of the imperialist system. And uh, it is also, uh, uh, well, one of the reasons that uh, brought us to uh, this discussion uh, this evening that we had uh, a great uh, discussion and uh, differences uh, after the beginning of the military intervention of Russia last year inside our own organizations, which, which led uh, to a recent split, uh, unfortunately, that we had. Uh, we had uh, great discussions on the understanding of uh, imperialism and uh, the nature uh, of this war, uh, whereas uh, uh, parts of our organizations, uh, organization that split off, um, as some of our comrades today already mentioned, understood, uh, uh, yeah, mostly every uh, capitalist country has to be imperialist and also the war that Russia uh, is um, enforcing as an imperialist uh, war, which is not our understanding of this war, but more uh, closer to what the CPA stands it as an issue of uh, uh, defense uh, uh, defense um, against the NATO aggression. We're still uh, um, discussing this uh, matter of imperialism and uh, also the nature of this war and uh, try to also understand an anti-imperialist stance of the international uh, working class. For this, we it's, I think, uh, good to mention that we are in preparation for a Congress that we will uh, hold in uh, October this year uh, with also hopefully uh, great international participation um, concerning uh, an international debate on anti-imperialism and proletarian internationalism uh, today. Um, I don't know, uh, this was just spontaneous short <laughs> introduction of uh, our organization. Uh, I'm happy for anyone else to uh, maybe assist and add some things, or of course you can uh, ask. I hope we will stay in contact in one way or another and uh, uh, yeah, continue the different discussions that will definitely bring us forward in our struggle. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I think it was a good summary of uh, our organization and um, I would like to end the discussion now. And I would uh, like to thank you again for uh, joining us. I hope we can uh, go on with the discussion with uh, CPIM. And um, yeah, thanks again for, for being here and um, have a good evening, comrades. Bye.